So I wanted to continue on with that uh, outline regarding uh, feudalism and uh, hopefully we can get through it uh, in this little segment here. Uh, I have just a little bit, you know, I have another, another bit of time where I can do a recording. So I'm just going to do it real quick. Um, so we, we left off with uh, William the Conqueror. Okay, so William the Conqueror um, comes in and this is when feudalism really takes hold in England. Okay, so we still have the, the, the Danish Vikings, uh, you know, uh, occupying part of the country. And, and so William the Conqueror comes in and uh, establishes a whole new order. And, and that's, uh, that new order is on, you know, on, on the lines of the Holy Roman Empire's uh, feudalism, uh, William the Conqueror's from uh, Brittany, part of modern day France, but not part of the Holy Roman Empire. And, um, and then so he establishes, you know, himself as the king of the Britons and uh, in England. And uh, things change quite a bit in England and feudalism as, you know, to the degree that we know uh, the details about feudalism, uh, a lot of those details come from historians looking at uh, the feudalism that existed in England after the conquest of William. Okay. And this is sort of the moving into the high period of feudalism where Feudalism was an accepted way of life, and things ran relatively smoothly, and um, there was some a sense of stability, uh, especially in England. This is really the first time of stability since the Romans left. Okay. Uh, so feudalism in England. Um, you have this system of land lordship, like, you know, we have the word landlord. This is, uh, comes from this feudalistic uh, way of thinking about things. And, um, and again, uh, to some degree, we would say that the king owned all the land, but even the king uh, would at least rhetorically dress up what you know, their control over the land as sort of something that they held uh, from God, who really owned the land. And, and then the king's holdings could be parceled out to barons and dukes and knights and each, at each level, and it was this pyramid structure, and the pyramid structure was very real. Um, at each level, everyone was just holding the land, property as land, um, and not having ownership over it. Um, so that, that's a key, key distinction here. Uh, we have this vassalage uh, sort of relationship. So whoever is parceling out part of their landed property to somebody else, they're the Lord. So that's, that's really what the word Lord uh, indicates is that there's somebody who's actually parceling out and giving a fief, some parcel of land to a vassal. So the vassal is the person who's receiving, the Lord is the one who's giving. Okay. Um, and then the serfs belong to the land so that if, if a, a knight received a fief of land, it came with serfs already living on the land and working the land. And then what that knight could do is, um, is just try to run that fiefdom as efficiently as possible and get as much produce out of the serfs, um, you know, because they would owe him like taxes or, or you know, tribute and things like that. And, um, and I'll get a little more into detail about how that works. Um, 
but uh, the serfs even owed labor to the lord of the manor or the fiefdom. And so, so that's um, how someone who received a fiefdom would be able to uh, convert it into wealth. And wealth now is in terms of land uh, holding, so it's a land holding economy. The land is wealth, including the serfs on it, and the agricultural produce of, of the land is, you know, based on the labor of the serfs. That's part of the wealth of a lord. And then even knights and squires. So if you could parcel out part of your fiefdom to knights, then they old, owed you as a vassal, they owed you a uh, fealty, they, they owed you uh, loyalty and would come if you called up, you know, people in arms, they were obligated to come. And so that was also part of the wealth. But money, uh, you know, especially the way that we think of money today, was not operating as a means of economic exchange. Everything was about land, exchanging land, and exchanging agricultural products, uh, and exchanging labor and other kinds of favors, and especially exchanging military service. So these were negotiations and things were kind of negotiated, but uh, not in terms of money. Okay, so um, that's a little different from the way that we tend to uh, think about economics. And so that's an important thing in Marx is that he, he points to feudalism as an example of a, of a different sort of economy from the capitalist economy that we uh, experience today, and especially we're experiencing, you know, capitalism a little differently in Marx's day. Okay. Then, um, uh, of course, in feudalism, feudalism uh, is very much tied in with the Roman Catholic Church. And so there's a lot of religious aspects to feudalism. Each manor would have a, a church. Um, would have a chapel, you know, rather usually a very small uh, church a building, and there would be a priest assigned there. And and um, if if it were a larger sort of uh, town or area where you could draw in lots of uh, people to the church, then you might have an abbot who would be a larger scale sort of clergy member, and they might even have a fiefdom of their own. Okay, so, um, but religion was very much integrated into the everyday life, uh, uh, and especially the weekly life uh, of the serfs and, 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 and the uh, more elite people. And one thing that, uh, that was big during this time period with Roman Catholicism was the veneration of relics. And a relic would be like uh, a, a bone or some other personal artifact or other other parts of bo body parts were very popular in, in this uh, this thing. Uh, but maybe a saint, like Saint Peter's right knuckle, you know, and, and then they the, then a church would cherish this as a as a blessed object, as a sacred object, and then people would actually travel great distances to come and see these relics and to you know because it's like a connection with the history of the church and it's something that you can directly observe and be in proximity to and then feel like the history of the church and 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 this was of course uh, encouraged by the pope and and um you know, and, and propagandized to, to get people to do this. And so people were going on pilgrimages, more wealthy people. Now, serfs couldn't go on pilgrimage. And that was like 85% of the population. So the vast majority of people did not go on pilgrimage. But people who were not serfs 
had liberty to move about, and they did. They, they would travel quite far distances, uh, especially to go to churches uh, that, um, that had particularly popular or fantastic or intriguing relics. Now, one way that, that these relics were obtained, and, and their authenticity, of course, is very questionable, but one, one way that these relics were obtained is through the Crusades. And the Crusades were a number of military expeditions where the Europeans went out to the Holy Land, that's to Palestine, uh, and tried to recapture the Holy Land in the name of Christianity, to set up a Christian kingdom uh, in uh, Palestine. And uh, to some extent, they were effective, but mostly not so effective. And one thing is that the crusaders, who were then kings and knights and dukes and you know people of this high rank and who had a lot of wealth and who also owned a lot of property, back in Europe, they weren't in it for the long haul. They were just, they were going on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. They just did it with swords and, and killed people along the way, you know, and conquered territory, but kind of as a, just a pilgrimage, you know, just a one-off kind of, you know, thing and to see the Holy Land and maybe to find some, some rare relic that they could bring back to their fiefdom and set up in a chapel and, and then draw pilgrims to their, um, their church. So um, this is something that still really sticks in the consciousness of the Islamic world because you just have these waves and waves, nine crusades. These are the, the effective uh, crusades that really went into the Holy Land, to Palestine. Um, just wave after wave, uh, you know, from, from 1096 all the way to 1272, just wave after wave, nine waves of military uh, slaughter. I mean, and it was just pillaging, you know. Um, and, and it, you know, there is a weird sort of disconnect in, in these crusades and that is particularly um, exemplified by the sack of Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade. At the end of the crusade, as the crusaders were like heading back to Europe, they stopped at Constantinople. That's Constantine's city that he built. It was the, the seat of government for the Roman Empire at the time. And they sacked it. And the Roman Empire was officially Christian, right? The official religion of the Roman Empire was Christianity. These crusaders, you know, fighting the infidels. And you know, this is where that word infidel really comes into play that we hear so much from Muslims uh, nowadays. Um, that really was a, a crusader term. Uh, it's just been kind of reversed, and and um, and in this fourth crusade, the the crusaders on the way back to Europe just stopped by and sacked Constantinople. All right, hold on one second. I'm gonna let my cat in. All right, you gonna come in? Come on. Come on. He always uh, hesitates at the doorway, all right, at the at the threshold. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> so the Crusades were a, a big part of feudalism, and and uh, you know, somewhat kind of a, a ridiculous thing. Uh, but it, it was a way of of getting a lot of wealth, and wealth that was more like what we think of wealth as. Uh, like money wealth, but it was in the form of treasures, in the form of relics, um, but sometimes gold, you know, but uh, lots of artifacts of all sorts were just looted uh, from the Middle East. 
and taken back to Europe. And so here we have, um, you know, one sort of story of primitive, so-called primitive accumulation. And, and Marx has a chapter about primitive accumulation in, in capital um, because one of the justifications for capitalism is that, well, capitalists can, can, can uh, manipulate the labor of people who aren't capitalists because the capitalist has the money, has the capital, has the wealth, uh, and nobody else could do what they could do. So since they have all this wealth, that's what justifies them in manipulating the labor of other people to, in order to gain more wealth. Um, but the, the question that Marx wants to ask was, well, how did they get it in the first place? How did they accumulate it primitively, like at the beginning, back in the day? How did they get the money in the first place? And, uh, and so here's one explanation of how they got the money in the first place. They looted it from the Middle East. Okay. Um, and there are, uh, during this time period, and this is kind of significant for, you know, because this is kind of laying the seeds for the demise of feudalism. As feudalism is flourishing, it's laying the seeds of its own demise. So you know that's that's uh, really important, and 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 this is very important for like uh, Enrique de Sel that we're going to look at at the end of the term. Uh, he's a contemporary author writer right now, but he's thinking in these similar terms about the Latin American experience and how dominant Eurocentric North American Anglo uh, culture is laying the seeds of its own demise, okay? And, and how, does, uh, how does the experience of the underclass uh, like Latin Americans, uh, especially in the form of you know, indigenous experience, how can that sort of lead to the next phase of development uh, in world history? All right, so, um, so this primitive accumulation is part of the laying the seeds of the demise of feudalism, but also the Knights Templar um, come about at this time. And the Knights Templar, now they're in it for the long haul. They are actually priests, they're, they're clergy members. Uh, ordained as an order uh, from the Pope, authorized by the Pope. And they're some of the best um, fighters and warriors um, in the Crusades. They're mercenaries, you know, you can hire them uh, for, you know, if you need some extra men or you need special, uh, uh, special detail for security. This is kind of like the black water of the day. Hey, hey, give me a break. You want to go outside now? Come on. Um, okay, so uh, nice Templar, if you're familiar with Blackwater or these other mercenary firms that exist today, it's kind of similar, you know. Um, uh, they had very little, uh, uh, you know, very little loyalty to anything. Uh, they're just, they're basically in it for uh, the glory and the wealth and and of course um, they did focus on money you know they like to be paid in money and and as Scheidler talks about the more that you militarize a society and especially on campaigns that are over long distances uh, extended where you need logistics and, and extending things out geographically, money comes into play. And the Knights Templar then become, uh, and, and, and the Knights Templar are spread out all along the routes back and forth between Europe and the Middle East in these crusades. And they kind of are like the the guides for all the crusaders who really don't know what they're doing. They've never been out of their little fiefdom or, you know, relatively close. Now they're going on these long distances. They don't know what they're running into. The Knights Templar are these expert sort of guides and um, 
you know, uh, special military support and banks, you know, if you are going on crusade, you want to know that when you get out there, you're going to have access to wealth so that you can make sure you pay your, your army, uh, that you get them fed and that you're able to get all the way back uh, to Europe. The, the Templars, you know, made that happen by being bankers. And, and of course, now we're thinking in terms of money. So, so it, it begins to shift from a land-based economy to a money-based economy. And the Knights Templar considered by many people to be the first um, bankers in Europe, you know, as it, uh, as it emerges out of um, the Dark Ages, Middle Ages, medieval times, whatever, um, into being uh, modern Europe. Europe. And so uh, that's a kind of interesting sort of thing to think about because uh, the role of money is important here from the transition from feudalism into capitalism. Okay. And then at this time, uh, another thing that kind of uh, is a great uh, symbol of the flourishing of feudalism is the rise of universities. So uh, the modern university as we know it, that Cerritos College is, is modeled upon, and our curriculum is all modeled upon. That, um, that model of education came about in Europe during this period. Um, you know, the first university appearing, I think, in Bologna or at 1088. And then uh, there's lots of Italian universities that come online right about that time, and, and Notre Dame. So in Paris, you know, we know like about the Hunchback of Notre Dame, we're kind of familiar with that iconic cathedral. Around Notre Dame, uh, there grew up a, um, a university, which today is the University of Paris, is the Sorbonne. And, um, and it's existed essentially, you know, the same since uh, around, I think it's 1120 or something like that. So uh, this is one of the grand accomplishments of feudalism is to develop uh, the university system and, and, uh, and really to, to add new impetus to education and learning and science. You know, so these are, this is laying the seeds of the scientific revolution which then is also part of capitalism's takeover of feudalism. So again, feudalism is laying the seeds of its own demise. Okay. Another great accomplishment is the, the Gothic cathedrals. Um, and so like Notre Dame, when it first started out, uh, was not the Notre Dame that we see today. It started out as a much smaller scale, sort of more Romanesque type building. Uh, but then during this time period, in this, this high medieval period, uh, and, and this took hundreds of years to do, uh, I think Notre Dame took something like 150, maybe more years to, from the groundbreaking to, you know, the, the final sort of results. Uh, it took um, maybe even over 200 years. Uh, and you can see it in the building because there's different styles of architecture in the same building. You know, they start out with one idea, they kind of accomplish that, but they're like, oh yeah, but why don't we do this? You know, with several generations later, they're like, oh, but well, we need this more, uh, more, you know, what would they could consider more modern sort of architecture. And there was lots of innovations happening in architecture. They were learning a lot of things along the way. So that um, these medieval Gothic cathedrals you know, these are where you get all these sculptures of gargoyles and knights and kings and some biblical depictions and sometimes some really horrific kind of uh, depictions of hell or heaven and and it's all kind of mishmash because it does happen over generations and generations, but very ornate and very meticulous and um, uh, quite interesting. Um, you know, and that's what really that kind of weird combination of styles and this kind of morbid sort of arc, uh, art, artwork 
uh, is all part of it. And, you know, that's what we call the Gothic style of uh, cathedrals. And Gothic here refers to the Goths, uh, which were the people who inhabited modern day France when the Romans came in. Okay, so uh, that's that. I was thinking if there's any, it seems like there's something else I wanted to say about cathedrals, but uh, but, but but that's that's good for now. So so you know these are some pretty big accomplishments and and things that are very valuable uh, and impressive uh, from feudalism. I mean, even the Crusades were relatively successful. It's just um, it's hard to understand the whole justification for it. Okay. So that, that looks good for now. So I will see you in the next video.